All right, welcome to episode 85 of Seize the Moment podcast. And today we have a very special guest. We have Sophia Samatar. She's the author of the novels A Stranger in Alondria and The Winged History. She's also the author of the short story collection Tender, Monster Portraits, and the new book of the dead featured in philosophy through science fiction stories. Her work has won several awards, including the World Fantasy Award, and she teaches African literature, Arabic literature, and speculative fiction at James Madison University. Welcome, Sophia. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. And then, Sophia, can you tell us a little bit about your latest project and how it came mm -hmm. to fruition? Yeah. Um, so the new book of the dead is a short story, um, which is in the um, which is in the collection that you mentioned, uh, philosophy through science fiction stories, and it actually started when I read uh, another book called Science Fiction and Philosophy, and this is um, it was edited by Susan Schneider. It came out I think about five years ago, and um, it is it is a, a an anthology of readings, which includes both science fiction stories and essays on philosophy. Mm -hmm. And I was really struck when I was reading it by the similarity between these practices, right? The similarity of method, because they both, both science fiction and philosophy operate through the thought experiment. And so to, when you when you read the experience of reading this book, which was a collection of both, there were times when I was like, wait, is this a, is this a science fiction story or is this actually an essay on philosophy that I'm reading right now? Um, so I was I was and I, I'd always kind of, you know, had the idea that science fiction and speculative fiction in general, this kind of umbrella group that includes uh, science fiction and fantasy and horror that there is something philosophical about this tradition. But by the time I finished this book, I was like, wow, you know what science fiction is? It's philosophy that makes good TV. Mm -hmm. That was like my new <laughs> definition of, of science fiction by the time I got done reading this book. Mm -hmm. And in particular, there was an essay by um, Derek Parfit, who was a British philosopher um, who died a few years ago. And um, his area of study, he was interested in identity. And his essay was in a part of the book that I found very compelling because it was all about, you know, consciousness and cognition and kind of philosophy of mind. Um, and Derek Parfit, who, and I, I don't know a whole lot about him, uh, although I did read in an obituary that he was such a passionate reader of philosophy that he would, somebody described him as brushing his teeth and reading Kant at the same time. Mm -hmm. So um, fun at parties, I guess we can yeah. say. Um, <laughs> but he, he um, in this, in this uh, essay of his, he proposed this thought experiment, which was imagine that you've been invited to go to another planet wonderful, beautiful planet. And the way that you're going to get there is teletransportation. Mm -hmm. And this is a process in which basically there's a machine that's going to zap you and destroy you completely. So all your cells, body, brain, everything is gone. And at the same instant, the matching machine on the distant planet will spit you out right, completely psychologically continuous with your earth self, same cells, same memory, same personality, same everything, would you go? And he says, most people would say no, because like, I'm going to be destroyed. That's not, you know, that that thing on the other planet, that's a replica, that won't be me. And so then he goes on and he says, okay, imagine it this way. What if it's not instant? What if you're going to be, you're going to go through the same process, but a little bit at a time. So first, 1% of you is destroyed and instantly replicated. And then 2%. So now you're 98% here and 2% on the distant planet. Mm -hmm. And he, he asked the question, at what point do you cease to be you? Wow. Do you ever cease to be you? do you do is it is it when you're down to 49 percent but you're still you know alive on the other planet and what struck me about this when i was reading it was just like this sounds horrible like <laughs> this sounds like the worst experience ever to be like slowly in these tiny bits destroyed and reconstituted on a different planet and i guess in a way maybe this is where fiction and philosophy sort of part ways because 
this didn't seem to bother Derek Parfit at all. He was like, oh, what, you know, what is it like? And what's the number? And has, and I was like, ah, this sounds horrible. Um, and I do think that that art, um, for me at any rate, is very concerned with the sensorium. It's about experience. So it's about what you what you feel and what you experience with your senses. Um, and, and art is an experience. You know, it's not an argument, really. It's, it's something that you experience. And so at that point, I became um, just really interested in trying to picture or imagine not just brain upload, which there have been many, you know, stories and, and people thinking about, you know, uploading, uploading brains and people thinking about really doing it, but like, what is that like? What is the experience of, you know, passing and of, of being uploaded from one state to another? And then I thought, you know what? We actually have manuals for this. We have mm -hmm. guidebooks for doing this kind of teletransportation in a way. And those are the books of the dead, which I had not read at that time. So the Tibetan book of the dead, the Egyptian book of the dead. Um, and I did read them for this project. And then I was just absolutely just hooked and smitten um, by the Egyptian book of the dead, which is a gorgeous book with these incredibly rich um, and powerful images and a sort of bizarre dream logic that seems absolutely right. And so I, and I, I really, you know, I liked the, I enjoyed reading the Tibetan Book of the Dead as well and would, you know, I would like to return to it, but, but it was the Egyptian Book of the Dead that that grabbed me. And maybe not surprisingly, because Egypt is a place that's important to me. I lived there for nine years. Uh, I study Arabic literature. So, um, but I, I quote a lot in the story from the Egyptian book, The Dead, and I was holding back hard. Like, I really just wanted to copy down the whole thing and be like, here's my art. Look how it is. <laughs> yeah. um, but I wound up writing this story, which is from the perspective of these nanobots. They are the God machines and mm -hmm. they are, um, they are affecting this, this transfer, this copying um, and transmission of the brain. And they are there to try to guide and help a human being through this pretty um, deeply, disturbing and even agonizing process. Right. And it's like when we're talking about our, when we're reading, like, let's say these books of the dead, what's I guess so interesting about them is in contrast to yours is that like in the books of the dead, we're talking about like the spirit, right? And sort of like, how do you kind of go on into the afterlife? But what was so cool about your story, it seemed like you were actually still remaining in this life or in this universe, but you were doing so in a kind of different incarnation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's why it's the new book of the dead, because right. this is not it is actually very, very materialist. It is not about I mean, the story, the story assumes that your, uh, you know, whatever you may have that could be identified as a spirit or a soul is somewhere in it does not exist apart from your parts. So so the 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 brain has to be, you know, very carefully handled and copied and transferred into this potentially everlasting or at least very long lasting and of course infinitely copyable form. Right. And it seems like in terms of science fiction, I don't know, like, would you guys agree with me that um, let's say there's been this sort of progression, I think, in terms of like linear terms, where in the beginning or on a while back, science fiction was more about kind of eternity and the afterlife and sort of thinking in terms of metaphysics, whereas now with the kind of, you know, let's say, uh, with the invention of like different types of technology, it's more so about kind of living in this world and sort of how do we prolong life here? And how does immortality become possible through technology? Well, I mean, there are talks of, uh, especially in futurist circles, that uh, we may actually be able to upload yeah. our consciousnesses one day. And um, what I like about your story is um, it sort of describes what that experience might be like and what uh, a consciousness may experience. But it does then beg to, uh, you know, the question, is, is that really you? Is, is it just your memory that's sort of um, being uploaded? Is, is your uh, consciousness continuing or is it just a different separate consciousness? Um, also, just even just describing what it could be like if you're in an entirely new body or if you see what your old body and it's it's 
it's separate from you and you, the experience of that. Um, and it's very interesting what, you know, how you describe what could be and what we might actually be experiencing uh, in the not so distant future. Right. And then, yeah. so, and Sophia, in your kind of interpretation of that thought experiment and even going into your story, what do you think? Do you think that's still the same person? I do. Or at least I think it's it's same enough. Mm-hmm. I think it's same enough not to um, not to really matter. And this is actually where you know. So in the essay by Derek Parfit, this is the direction that he's going, and he he winds up in that essay saying, um, well, he talks about two different theories of of persons of what a person is, um, and these are broadly, you know, he says. He, he's kind of saying, you know, many, there are many different ways of looking at this, but they can be sort of seen in these, these two basic different ways. Um, and one of them is the ego theory, which he associates with Descartes and most of Western philosophy, where there's some, you know, particular special essence to you. Um, and, and this is from this view, you should not go to the other planet, because the, your essence will be missing. And then the other theory is the bundle theory which um, he actually associates with Buddhism. He quotes Buddhist texts, um, um, but also, but also David Hume, who I, and I think his his um, I think it's Hume's idea of a person as a bundle of perceptions. I think this is where the term bundle theory comes from. Um, and according to the bundle theory, you are a set of elements that is held together by a by by a sort of cause and effect relationship such as memory. So something happens to you and you remember it. And it's that kind of psychological continuity that ties you together and, and makes you a person, but it's not one thing. So, so Parfit says, well, it doesn't matter. You know, it, it, actually what he says is ordinary survival is about as bad as being destroyed and replaced with a replica. And he says, people who say, no, I don't want to go to the other planet because that's not going to be me. He says, the way that you are demanding to be you, no future version of you that occurs in a normal way can fulfill that special way. No, no future you. If you just ordinarily survive for 10 years, that's not going to be you in the way that you are now demanding this person on the other planet be a perfect replica. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's I mean, no... potentially you tomorrow is not a perfect replica of you right now. Right. Yeah, exactly. Like there, there's no uh, rigid sense of self. Like you could you can maintain that. Uh, you could have that sort of um, concept of your identity. You could be trying not to change and to hold on. But inevitably, change is the only constant. You're always going through some kind of change. You're not literally the same you um, second to second, moment to moment. And so th- I think that's fascinating, too, because what's what's cool about the Book of the Dead um, that you drew inspiration from, it's it's interesting that they sort of that that concept of uh, being ripped apart uh, mm-hmm. in order to sort of uh, prepare you uh, to transform and, and go to the next place. It's interesting. You could look at that a few different ways. You could look at that uh, materially, materially, which is kind of what's going on in the story. But also, if you look at it um in a sort of uh, spiritual psychological sense, it is interesting that um, if if you could accept that sort of idea of being uh, ripped apart, so to speak, you can also transform uh, here and now in life, mm-hmm. in a matter of speaking. It's fascinating. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And this is what, I mean, this is part of what these God machines are trying to teach the character in the story is how to actually come to experience herself as a bundle. Because now what she is going to be is this collection of nanobots. She's, she is going to be in a, in a way that she has never maybe recognized or acknowledged before, um, a bundle. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, when you say that these, you know, that, that there's something, um, you know, something in the, in the Egyptian Book of the Dead that really speaks to us um, still, I, that's something I felt very powerfully as I was reading. So it was not only, you know, the beauty of the images, but also just this deep sense of 
of recognition and and a familiarity among these people who lived, you know, thousands of years ago, um, that they, you know, this this was a society that was really preoccupied with achieving immortality, very much in the way that contemporary American society, you know, has people who are, you know, has those futurists who are like, how can we, how can we literally do this? I'm not one of them, by the way. Um, like, I'm already tired. So <laughs> eternity, you know, here, you know, count me out on that one. I'm, I'm not interested in that. But but I do find it very interesting to think about um, and to see the, the the close relationship between these societies that are so distant in time and space. And of course, this is what the God machines in the story have recognized. And they have sort of realized as they're trying and experimenting and, you know, they lose some people. Some people just die of shock on their way uh, into this into this new existence. And what the God machines realize is that, OK, if psychological continuity is so important at the level of the individual, then why wouldn't cultural continuity, that is a continuity of images, why wouldn't that be important for the survival of a person? And, you know, if individual memory is, is so crucial in one case, why wouldn't collective memory be just as important? Um, for these humans that we are trying to bring over to the other side. So they, um, so they then incorporate and they start speaking to people through these images from the Egyptian Book of the Dead in order to establish that sense of, of, um, of cultural continuity, which of course is, is pretty much, you know, pure Afrofuturism. I mean, this is Afrofuturistic philosophy yeah and what was the significance of um i think it was the symbolism of having to be awake like while you're going through the process in order not to be eaten by the eater of did that like why did the person have to be awake um the person has to be awake um because in my um imagining of this process the just the shock of suddenly waking up in the new i mean this is why i i decided to kind of take off from Derek Parfit's second example of the slow transfer, because in order for the person to feel that sense of continuity and persistence, which we know is so important for, for feeling like one has is continuing the same life. Um, so the person needs to stay awake and needs to actually experience the transfer. And, and at one point in the story, you know, the God machines say, if, the, if you didn't have to do this, there would be no need for a book of the dead. I mean, the book of the dead exists because it's necessary to, to make that journey from one state to another. There's no, there's no shortcut, you can't jump. Um, and you know the the ancient Egyptians had their own reasons for which I don't know exactly what they were you know for deciding that you needed to go through you know and experience this this process. Um, but in the case of the story, it's just the idea of of um, the experience of suddenly waking up, and you are a connection a collection of nanobots that weighs like you know 15 kilos. No you're 15, 15 centimeters long, I think, and you weigh one and a half kilos. Anyway, you're the size of a brain. Your right. whole body is now the size of a brain. That's all you are. And that that, to suddenly wake up like that um, was too much of a shock. And people were just, were just dying. Yeah. And it made me think of the song. Um, so there was a great heavy metal singer way back when. I mean, he, he wasn't it wasn't, I guess, that long ago, but uh, his name was Ronnie James Dio. And he was really into like he, like he was into like um, not only philosophy, but like medieval stuff, science fiction, etc. I think people know Dio. Uh, well, OK, I would get him. So I don't. Walker wants to see, see? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so he he like he was like kind of like a mystic too like i don't know if, i don't think he necessarily like believed in mysticism but his music like heavily covered mystic themes so it was interesting because he has this song called hungry for heaven and the kind of um the premise of it is like well you're hungry for heaven but you need a little hell and that really made me think of that right like when i was reading your story because the idea is you can't have one part of life without the other you can't not go through this process of the underworld and then hope to be reborn and it's like it just goes from zero to 100. So I think the idea there is like, so the way I interpret it as is that you were pretty much saying that it means that 
it's not a sort of human trait to go from like, let's say, you know, to go from, let's say the beginning of something and to go to automatically to finish and the end and like, the, you know, the kind of the finished product that you're looking for, that the human experience is this actual journey as hard as it may be. And if you're like, let's say, if you kind of bypass the journey, then you're as good as dead. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's very well put. Yeah. 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 It's cool. It's like, uh, if you're, if you're asleep, how can you transform right it, it's it's like you almost need to be awake for for you to be sort of torn apart and then sort of reintegrate yourself if you're yeah. asleep through that whole process and then all of a sudden you wake up to this new uh version of reality it's it's too much and you can't uh fathom it you can't uh move into it you you, you can't accept it and um i'm not sure if that's exactly uh what you meant in your story but I guess I'm just sort of projecting that onto it, but it's cool. It's like a fun experience, you know, to kind of have that projection onto the story. Yeah, yeah I think it works. I think it absolutely works. And, you know, the, 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 one of the images that goes through the whole story and through the whole book of the dead um, is of the myth of Osiris, who mm. is torn to pieces and, and then has to be reassembled. And I was like, this is, this is brain upload, right? This is, this is, you know, he has to be, he has to be taken apart and then he's reconstituted. It's almost as though, you know, that myth, it, it kind of matches very well with this idea of the, you know, the, the, the replicator that's going to take you apart piece by piece and then, and then reconstitute you um, on the other side. Yeah. And it's interesting because I think also from a clinical standpoint, a lot of times like, um, I mean, this doesn't happen as often, but this does happen, I guess, too often where um, so people sometimes are so kind of intent on holding on to their personalities where they really believe that they are who they are, whether they'll tell you, well, like, you know, I can change because this is just like who I am, or they'll tell you, well, I don't want to really change because I like, you know, who I am as, you know, maybe as difficult as my relationships are and as bad as some of my decisions familiar, it's comfortable. Yes, yes, yes. That and then also there's like a fear, by the way, of losing some part of them. So it's like, even if I, let's say alcoholism, right? If I kind of, you know, let's say give up or like stop, you know, engaging in this terrible behavior, it's sort of like I'm losing a part of myself that like, even though, right, even though let's say maybe, I don't know, something good can come of it, granted, but it's like, but do I really want to lose this part that's been a part of me for so long? And some people will actually tell you no. Mm. Yeah. And I think for the, for the main character in the story, you know, she is um, somebody who, you know, she's a researcher, she's, she's a fundraiser, she's been running the Immortality Project, this amazing project to kind of, you know, upload, um, upload human consciousness um, to, a, to a more durable form. And, uh, and she's really about control. And she's a very kind of ego theory <laughs> type of person. Um, and this is, this is something else about her, you know, this is something about her that, that needs to be broken down. And sort of the challenge for her throughout the story is, you know, can she, can she accept this? Um, can she come to view herself as this collection of little pieces, which is also connected to all other you know, little pieces of human beings. Because the other thing about these nanobot god machines is that they, you know, they can join together into one body, they can separate, they can, um, and so there's this very fluid idea, um, and, and fluid in an intense way, idea of, of community and belonging. And they, they are really about belonging and becoming more than being. Whereas, you know, the main character is very much about her being, her, you know, being in control and being in, in charge of this project. And so um, that's something that she doesn't want to let go of, uh, you know, so this is very hard, very hard for her to, to go through um, and to try to survive this process. Right. And it seems very reminiscent of the psychedelic experience where it's like you kind of go under and then the rebirth is not like a personal rebirth, but where you essentially see in some way. I mean, I don't know personally, I've never tried any of them, but um, you kind of see the sort of sense of unity with everything and everyone else. So we've had like several guests on who are like proponents of psychedelics and psychedelic researchers um, or research. And so they all pretty much say the same thing that like when people kind of take these like drugs or, you know, medications, hallucinogens or whatnot they pretty much have a sense of unity, whatever that is. And like the idea is, I guess, that they're no longer afraid of death because they understand in some sort of form they're going to continue in the universe. 
sounds pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> what I liked in the, in the story was um, her encountering her husband, who I believe at first, uh, it didn't sound like she knew that he was there, right? Yeah. She, she thought that he had died of some uh, rare brain disease that he wouldn't be able to continue and persist on the way she's, you know, currently uh, in the process of doing. And then actually encountering him there. And then you see that little, that story between, between them, the fact that, that um, when they were working on the research, um, they needed rich people to sort of uh, fund the research. And she was a big proponent of that. And he believed that anyone should be able to contribute as much as they could to be a part of the project. This isn't something that belongs only to rich people, but to everyone. Mm -hmm. So he goes away in secret, um, works on the project um, on his own. She thinks he's uh, dead, right? And it's sad because they they did love each other and there was this deep sense of connection between them. But mm -hmm. the, the rift that sort of came between them uh, when they had uh, different ideals, right, about how they wanted this project to go. It's it's interesting. And, and also, you'd think that she would feel uh, betrayed. But I suppose after having died, after having been alone, after he was gone, and sort of going through this process of, of uh, remembering who she is, and then encountering him there, it was kind of... Um, it's kind of it's actually it's nice it's kind of heartwarming actually so maybe it's kind she, of like an ego loss too like she didn't take it so personally anymore she, she seemed to just be overwhelmed by um compassion and just uh just happy to have seen him there and sort of like um there was this reconciliation uh between them even though you would think they'd be angry at each other it's almost as if um they understood each other yeah very psychedelic man that's, yeah. that's really the psychedelic experience. It's so interesting. Yeah. Well, and they did, you know, they they betrayed each other, right? So, I mean, yes, he definitely betrayed her and went and sort of went on with the project behind her back. But she she also betrayed him in that, you know, when they got the big government contract, um, she was like, yes, absolutely, all the way. And he was like, it, you know, because this is this is all the funding that we need from now on to continue. And, and, and to him, that was completely, you know, they were then going to lose control and not be able to decide who would receive um, the benefits of this technology. And for him, because he was he was committed to um, to people who who didn't have so much, you know, and th this those people, um, you know, he felt a connection to them, um, and was and and was really moved by their circumstances, and so he had not felt from the beginning that they should be doing what she said, which was, you know, going for the 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 richest possible clients, and then when it came to the point of that contract, you know, so so in a way, but I I, I think these are things that I mean, I guess in a way it. it, it it is a vision um, in the story of like, what happens if like you're dead, really? They're they're dead and reborn at this point. So how much does like the arguments that you were having on Earth, does that really matter to you anymore? And it's sort of like, no, you know, you thought this person was dead, and now you find out that you can actually be together. Um, you know, there's a, there there are a lot of things that that fade away at that point. And of course, the other thing, I mean, you mentioned compassion. So, um, one of the premises in the story, this is a very technotopian story. Um, this is a story where the technology is good and wants the best for us. And in fact, um, the God machines are much more um, compassionate toward humans than humans tend to be toward one another. So at this point, you know, after making the crossing, when they have taken the form, they are themselves God machines. And this, this is, you know, the language of the Egyptian Book of the Dead is that you will, when you cross, you will become a God. You will be like the gods once you have made this crossing successfully. Um, and so they then, you know, have all the kind of all embracing compassion of the God machines. And so they're viewing each other um, through those through those eyes. Yeah, and it's so interesting that like, um, so it's like, 
here's, I guess, the sort of paradox here that you have these machines that are just, I guess, more compassionate than humans, even though they technically were created by humans. Yes. Yeah. Right. They're, they're like, you know, um, I mean, and there are, I, I, I would say probably most of our, of our science fiction visions are of technology that we make and it's worse than us. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's partly, we're speaking from experience because a lot of technology that we have made is worse than us. Um, and it's also, um, you know, from a fiction perspective, it kind of makes a better story. Like mm -hmm. this is the problem with writing a utopia, right? It's like, if everything is so great, then like what happens in the story that's very challenging. Uh, it's, 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 it's a hard problem to get around. But if you make something where the technology is worse than us and everything is terrible, then you immediately have a story like handed to you and you just go to work. Right. Um, and, and in writing this story, you know, I, I haven't written um, too many stories in which, th that are like this one, in which the technology is, um, is something that, that, is better than we are and improves our lives. Um, but I think more than what the technology itself is like, what I was interested in or what I was trying to explore through writing the story is human desire for technology. Because I, this is one of those um, things that I see connecting um, my own contemporary culture to that of the ancient Egyptians is this, I mean, if the people that wrote the book of the dead were here now, I feel like they'd be like, yes, let's go. Like, let's get going with this brain upload thing and let's make this a reality because this is what we, you know, this is our, this is our dream. Um, and the reason that it was important for me to explore this um, which I've done with a, with a few stories recently, sort of looking at the, the, the human desire for technology and technological change over an immense amount of time. So there's this story, there's a story I wrote last year as well called Fairy Tales for Robots, mm -hmm. um, which, and that came out in an anthology called Made to Order, Robots and Revolution. It's edited by Jonathan Strand. And um, and, and in that story, it's, you know, I'm tracing images from the fairy tale tradition that are like robots. I mean, from Pinocchio to the golem to, you know, all of the, basically saying, we have wanted this for a long time. Um, again, this is, this is my sort of interest in cultural continuity, that it's not, you know, we tend to see, you know, the past is old and dead and forget it, and now we're in the new time. But I, I don't think it is that, um, that separate in terms of the desire for new tools and the desire for these things. And um, that's something that I was, I, I wanted to explore because I'm sort of talking to myself with that um, as, as you know, with many pieces of writing, it's something that I feel I need to work through because I think in order to have um, in order to decide what you want to do with technology and how you want to use it in your own life, um, and in, in order to have that kind of ethical response, it's helpful to realize that you are embedded in it and connected to it and that you belong to a long tradition of the desire for it, rather than saying, as I at times have been prone to do, you know, let's just get rid of like, this is horrible. I hate this thing that we made. Let's get rid of it. And I have nothing to do with it. And I want to, you know, go to some time when it didn't exist. I, I just, I think that that's not a particularly um, helpful response. It's more that a, a, a response that I wanted to pursue is like, we're here and we're in it. Um, and you know, we have to make, we have to deal with it. And, but not in a way that is just kind of all or nothing. Like either I'm, I'm a hundred percent always trying to get the new update and get the new version of the new thing, or I'm completely like, you know, throwing all the technology away and, and trying to sort of negotiate and work, work out um, my own response in, in the midst of that. Um, and so one thing that is helpful from, for me is to think about this long tradition of people having a desire for technology. Um, also, of course, to think about my favorite thing, 
which is reading and writing. Literacy, of course, being a technology. Mm -hmm. um, and so trying to look at it from that perspective as well and say, you know what? We didn't always have um, literacy and it does change the brain. You know, every time a child learns to read, there's a good book on this by Marianne Wolf. It's called Proust and the Squid. And she goes into sort of the reading brain, like what happens to the brain when we read and how reading actually rewires and changes the brain. Um, and that's something that's helpful for me to think about when I think about like smartphones and I'm like, oh no, they're, you know, they're messing up our brains and they're making us stupid. And it's like, you know, this is also my, my most beloved thing of, of reading and writing arguably um, kind of does the same thing. I mean, this was Socrates, wasn't Socrates like against writing? Um, there's a, there's a, a um, a description of, of Socrates speaking against writing and saying and telling a story, which is actually about the Egyptian god Thoth, the god of science, who brought writing to the king of the Egyptians and says, look, I have brought you writing. Isn't this wonderful? And Socrates telling this story says, no, this is a terrible idea because it's going to make people stupid. Mm -hmm. People aren't going to know anything anymore. They're not going to remember anything because they're just going to write it down. Um, so, yeah. That's, uh, that's something that I think about as sort of a corrective to myself when I'm, um, you know, feeling, uh, what should I say, negative toward contemporary technology. I agree with you, right? It's like as if, uh, let's say you're, you're on a boat, you're going down a river, if you could, you could resist the river's flow, or you could decide to, since you're already on the, you know, the times are changing, you could sort of steer the ship and, and work with the change, right? And also, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned smartphones, and uh, a lot of people have, are resistant against that as well. Um, have you heard of this thing? It's called the extended mind thesis. Mm -mm. So essentially, the idea is our phone, since, um, since we have uh, ease of access to it, we have it on our person almost at all times. And literally, we have access to all the information on the planet, as long as you have an internet connection. It's almost like having an extended mind, an extended uh, appendage that yeah. you can use at any time. And in a way, we're already kind of like, um, not uh, not androids, but like, uh, cyborgs. like cyborgs. Yeah. 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 And it, that that's that's an interesting uh, concept to sort of um, look at it through. Because then, then instead of resisting these new technologies, you're sort of working with them, changing with them. And you could just sort of be creative about how you go about life now that you have access to, to this thing. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be something bad, right? Um, I feel like it's a tool and just it, it matters who is using the tool. I think that's probably the most essential aspect of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, one of my um, um, one of my ways of thinking about this is actually um, there is another story that I wrote, which is called Hard Mary. Uh, mm. And it is about a in that story i imagine a sort of future amish community and there are these young amish girls in the future and they find a robot uh and it's been kind of chucked on the side of the road and they you know take it back and kind of clean it up and then of course it wakes up um and this this then brings a lot of questions into that community and this story is inspired by well so i am um uh, Mennonite on my mom's side. So my great grandfather was Amish. Um, and then my, my husband's father was actually born Amish. They left the Amish uh, church when my, my father-in-law was 10 years old. And so in talking to him about like how he grew up, I was very interested in um, the Amish approach to technology, which is not as some people think actually all or nothing, you know, like they don't have any technology. No. Um, but they decide, they meet and they discuss and they decide what they're going to have. Mm -hmm. So they might decide, for example, and different communities will decide different things um, because there's a lot of, you know, freedom within the overall group. Each little, you know, each small community might have its, its very different um, rules on what they've decided for themselves. So they might decide, for example, that they need lights, they need electric light in the barn, mm -hmm. you know, for 
calving or something like that. Um, or they might decide that there will be, you know, um, w just one machine, like there will be one thresher and then everybody will, you know, all the families will be able to use that one thing or there will be a phone booth somewhere, you know, there will be one phone. Um, and so that's the, the kind of, and I was very interested in that kind of negotiation that, you know, it's not actually all or nothing, but it is like pause and take a breath for a second, which I think is a very helpful attitude. And don't just rush willy nilly into whatever new thing came because it's the new thing, but just stop and think before you step and think in community um, about what you want to do with this thing. And then of course, you know, in the story with the girls who find the robot, there are all kinds of questions because first of all, is this a machine or is it a person, right? This is mm -hmm. the essential thing. Because if she's a person, then potentially she can join the church, you know, and, but if she's a machine, then everybody's gonna have to have a meeting and decide, you know, can, can we keep this thing or not? And then because the girls have different opinions, some of them think she's a person, some of them think she's a machine. Some of them think some of them think she's a machine, but or sh some of them think she's a person. But it would be they're going to have a better chance of keeping her if they talk about her as a machine. So it gets very very complicated. But mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I I think that you know that that sense of um, that it's okay to pause and stop and think um, and decide what you want before. Um, before jumping into it. I think that's just a really helpful, helpful idea. Yeah, and on the topic, I guess topic of robots in general, why do you guys think that we've always been so obsessed with art artificial intelligence? You mean in terms of what, a like a benevolent one or a- No, anything. I mean, like if you think about like just science fiction and just like, you know, the populace in general, I mean, how many, I guess decades or even probably centuries, like, if, well, maybe not centuries, but let's say decades of like people were focusing on robots and artificial intelligence, what it means for consciousness, what would happen if we had them? Well, so <clears throat> imagine a, uh, imagine that there's a, a being that exists or, um, let's not call it a being but let's let's just call it a being yeah. just for uh the sake so say uh it has access to all knowledge right and um thinks a million to, or sorry orders of magnitude faster than we do and comes to conclusions orders of magnitude faster than we do and can organize and reorganize and produce things at orders of magnitude faster than we can right. and can also integrate so many different p variables and pieces of information that it can optimize for what might be the most correct uh, net positive effect for its constituents. Mm -hmm. If it's people, then it's people. Mm. Um, the idea of that is, is fascinating because then imagine that uh, you do create an artificial intelligence that all of a sudden, let's say it's uh, beneficent, right? Like it, 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 it's uh, it's working in our favor. Well, then imagine th the ability to produce, I don't know, Nobel Prize winning uh, discoveries um, every minute or so, right. or uh, I, I don't know how fast it would be. Right, so it's like God's on the earth. Yeah, yeah. essentially, yeah. And then imagine the kind of progress that they could bring once they come into existence. Gotcha. Um, I, I just get, I guess our interest is also in, well, one, can it be created? Can you create an artificial intelligence that has general human intelligence, like access to creativity, not just something that's programmed and does only what the program tells it to do. It could sort of be sentient in a way, right? Um, just the, yeah, I guess the the issue is can that even exist? Then too, would it be? Would we be friendly with it? Would it uh, think that humans are parasitic? Would it want to preserve uh, humans or or work in their favor? Yeah. So yeah, what do you I think? Well, I think that you know, I I think that there's a lot going on here with the yeah. with the obsession with robots, and I think that that is part of why it's so powerful, because anytime you have um, an image, and and you know, the monster would be another one. Um, the robot is another one of those images that kind of it it 
it, it sort of generates a lot of different associations. And some of those associations are opposite of each other. Um, you know, so it can, it can generate desire, you know, for this, this thing. It also generates fear that maybe this thing is going to be more powerful than me, or it's going to resent me in some way. And, um, and among the, the um, kind of images or associations that attach to the idea of a robot, right, are, they're, they're, they're incredibly various and incredibly powerful. So one of them is the idea is, is the idea of, of making a person, right, is, is connected to the idea of having children. I mean, when you have a child, you basically make a person. So, so the idea of making a person, but in another way, in this kind of technological way, I think it draws on some of those uh, those uh, very deep associations, you know, with with people making, with with reproduction. Also, you know, not only that the robots might become gods on Earth, but also that if you, you know, single handedly make a person, then you are God. Right. And that's also something that's very deep and very powerful. And then there's also the idea of um, of, of use, right, of instrumentalizing a person because robots are made generally for a purpose and they're used for work, right? And this has associations with slavery, which is another extremely, you know, deep idea. And I think that this is also what, um, you know, this something that culturally runs very deep. And I think this is also what brings up some of the fear right? Because there's a fear there's that, that, that the one who creates this being and decides that this being is not a person or not a real person in the way that I'm a real person, and therefore this being is just going to work for me. And that fear and that feeling that, wait a second, this being is going to have great resentment for me. Uh, and if it ever gets on top, then I'm in huge trouble. I mean, this is these are these are these are the fears of slave owners, right? And so all of that, I think, is wrapped up in the image of the robot, which is also, you know, and I also think there's something, something else I would say that's in there is also um, the experience of childhood. So not only the idea of making a child, making a person, but also the idea of, you know, playing with dolls, playing with toys, um, giving personalities to these objects, which is something that, you know, is, you know, this is something that children do. So I think that also that I think there's some kind of memory or association with very early days of of almost believing that the doll could be alive mm -hmm. and and a kind of magic that is involved in that. And so when you put all of that sense of, you know, wonder and of being a god or of being under the power of a god and of, you know, having a slave or being enslaved, it, I mean, this is just an explosive um, kind of set of ideas and 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 I think endlessly fascinating. Right. There was a, this reminds me of a movie. I don't remember what the name of it is now. I'm gonna look it up before we uh before we go. So in the film, like it's about this kid who's a writer, and so he's like really lonely, and so he's really brilliant, but like for whatever reason, like he can't get along with people. And so eventually he ends up writing the story and like of this girl that somehow or other she ends up coming into life. And so I forgot, wow, what was the name of the deal? So whatever. So she comes into life, right? So, and then as she comes into life, he as like, he creates her. He's like, oh, wow, I can actually have like the perfect girlfriend and I could write her into whatever I want her to be. And as the kind of story progresses, he actually realizes that he ends up losing control of her. And so like all of the things that he wants her to do, he ends up kind of resenting. And he's like, oh, this is like not really for me. And then after a while, she ends up kind of developing a mind of her own. And then he's like, wait, I don't understand. Like, why are you not doing what I'm telling you to do? And she's like, dude, like, this isn't real. And he's like, yeah, but you're not real. So it's like it kind of develops <laughs> wow. into the story, right? And you know, like how we have, um, like how people talk about, like you know, kind of creating like AI partners or whatever. I wonder what that would actually look like if you actually had like the model boyfriend or girlfriend. Would you actually be happy? So first, um, I know what movie you're talking. What, what's about. the name of it? I don't know. The I'm gonna name of it. now. I'm gonna look. It's, it up. A, it's a new movie. It's yeah. it's a newer movie. Right? Yeah, yeah. It, does. it came out. Uh, I don't know it. <laughs> So there's a, there's a movie that actually explores that idea of um, someone having a relationship with an AI. 
Uh, it was with the, uh, Joaquin Phoenix. It was called Her. Oh, yes, yeah. I saw that one. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, the way it was explored there, it felt. Oh, Ruby Sparks. Ruby Sparks. Yeah. It's cool. called Ruby Sparks. Sparks. Uh huh. That's the name of the book and the girl in the movie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, in her, it was, it was great. In the beginning, she was all for him. Uh, everything was going great. Right. But you also, she, the, sorry, her, the, uh, the AI also developed throughout their relationship and then um, decided to interact with other AIs. Right. And then all of a sudden, she, this was great for me. She meets Alan Watts. <laughs> and it's like, oh, Alan Watts, he's so interesting, right? <laughs> and then she leaves Joaquin Phoenix yeah. for Alan Watts, <laughs> which was, I don't know, for me, yeah, I really resonate funny. with that so hard. And uh, and yeah, and then he goes through the sadness of that, and um, it wasn't what he imagined it to, to be. Right. Um, but again, that's just an imagining of, of what that relationship is. But you know what's like. interesting? So I don't know if this happened in this movie, but like in Ruby Sparks, it was a great lesson for the kid, right? So like he's like in therapy the entire time. So Elliot Gould is his therapist in the film. And so all he does in the movie is complain about like his ex and how like people just don't understand him or whatever it is. Right? He's like, oh, you know, she left me when like, uh, I think it was his mother or somebody. I forgot it was either in the hospital or passed away. And he's like, oh, I can't believe she did that. You know, I'll never forgive her all of this stuff, right? So in the movie, Ruby Sparks ends up cheating on him. And he's like, I don't understand. Like, why would you do this to me? You're, you know, more of this sort of, you know, victim, uh, kind of victimizing himself and like how, you know, poor him, like he can't believe it. You know, he gave her life. She should be grateful, yada, yada. Right. And so in the story, he finally realizes that like, oh shit, like maybe I had something to do with this. So he finally runs into his ex and like he had, they have a conversation together. And so he says something along the lines of, he's like, oh, you know, I still haven't forgiven you for like what you did to me. You like left me when I needed you most. And she's like, dude, like what planet are you on? Do you remember our relationship? You were super self-absorbed. Everything was always about you. Whenever I brought up any issue, you constantly like kind of, uh, what's it called? You kind of brushed it off and then started talking about yourself again and how you were struggling and how difficult writing was and how people weren't recognizing your work and yada yada and then so through ruby sparks and even this interaction with the girl he finally realized like oh shit like you know maybe i was left and cheated on for you know reasons that had little bit to do with it darn <laughs> yeah well, <laughs> kind of sounds bad but i do want to check out the movie yeah. i feel bad for that aspect of it but i guess that that would that would mentally makes it a good story right? yeah and yeah. i feel like with these robot movies a lot of times i don't know if this is like the i don't know maybe not maybe in a lot of these stories this isn't the purpose like per se but i feel like a lot of the times like through these like robots or ai people a lot of people learn about themselves like would you guys agree yeah 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 i think so i mean it's certainly um you know in the in the story, Hard Mary, um, you know, the narrator of the story is one of these girls who has, who has found this robot. And she, um, she is learning a lot about herself, especially as she, you know, continues in her life, um, gets married, has children, um, starts living a life that is extremely, you know, focused on work. And, uh, and she kind of, you know, and it's very repetitive. She kind of gets up every day and she has to do the same things. And she, um, you know, it, it is beginning to turn some of the questions she was asking about the robot toward herself, you know, questions of, you, you know, what am I here for? And, and am, I, am I created just to work until I break down? Is, you know, is that it? Is, is that, you know, so first it was, you know, if it's, if it started with the question of, you know, is a, a robot a person, it kind of ends with the question of is a person a robot or, or how, you know, what are the different ways that you can, that you can look at those comparisons that maybe tell us something about the lives of humans or at least uh, the lives of some humans, and in this story, particularly the lives of women. Yeah, because you would discard a robot, I'm assuming, after it's like it's fulfilled its purpose or its use is over, right? Yeah. So what happens with a human? Like, oh, speaking of which, right? If we're talking about like even automating work, right? What happens to now all of the people who are going to be out of like factory jobs? And now it's like the idea is that, well, you know, as a society, that means we're going to have a lot of free time. 
but that's not really how capitalism works. So it's like if these industries are automating these positions, they're not going to automatically just now pay people to kind of like, you know, hang out or whatever to find purpose and meaning and, you know, kind of, let's say whatever, just enjoy their lives more. I mean, for the most part, what's going to happen is a lot of these industries are going to automate these jobs and these robots are literally just going to be replacements for people. And then once they're done, they're going to just replace them with other robots and so on and so forth. And the people are going to have no time because the people are going to spend all their time scrambling and hustling and trying to survive in some way. Yeah. yeah. And so what do you guys think, I guess, on a deeper level, what would it look like in the future if like most jobs are automated? Well, that's a hard one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, there are definitely uh, politicians and um, different sorts of people who already see that as an upcoming issue. So if, if you ask, let's say, Andrew Yang, that kind of question, he would say, um, uh, I, you know, he believes that uh, people should get some sort of a universal uh, basic income. Uh, there will come a time when jobs are automated. So many people will be out of work. And the way our system currently operates, um, that would just a lot of leave a lot of people disenfranchised and, and hustling, as you say. Right. Um, so, I mean, but then what would the future look like, you're asking? Yeah. Well... I mean, well, you can ballpark it, it. It's not like you have to know, obviously. Well, <laughs> if, it's, if it's the what negative it? version of it, uh, yeah. it could be, yeah, it could be a dystopia where um, uh, people live uh, well below their, their means. There, oh. there, there is all this automation and beauty and only the people who are um, rich or uh, have generational wealth or, or whatever are benefiting from this. Uh, but... Um, you know, everyone else essentially uh, is would be struggling. Yeah. Uh, that's one interpretation. Another one is, well, uh, going along with the automation, maybe uh, there are people who kind of are forward thinkers and then prepare for that sort of future. And uh, maybe we have a different ways to sort of create an income or maybe we, we dispose of the idea of income. Who knows? Uh, yeah. Maybe we'll think radically uh, differently, or maybe we'll once we have created the the AI, let's say that general intelligent AI, if it's if it works in our favor, then maybe it'll create enough abundance in the world where everybody has everything that they need. Uh, that could happen. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, or maybe you know, it will. Yeah, I was just gonna say maybe it will also, you know. Um, kind of in, inspire or force different ways of being um, among humans and in particular different ways of belonging and of, of coming together, of creating, you know, smaller communities and, and relationships and, um, and strategies, you know, for, for a collective kind of survival. Yeah, I was thinking that too. So I know like on the whole, and normally we're against like state-owned property. Well, not all property, obviously, but for the most part, like, you know, state-owned industries. But in this case, I would say it probably would make more sense rather than having a bunch of sort of, uh, let's say, I don't know, capital kind of venture capitalists owning these industries where you're going to probably have a handful of them like owning all of these, you know, kind of machines and AI or whatnot. And rather than that, right, have like, you know, kind of collectives, right? Have like groups own these industries together where they could kind of all benefit from them. There's that, or um, if if you're into the whole cryptocurrency mm -hmm. thing, uh, there could be a, a decentralized AI. I hear you. So imagine no authority, no country could shut it down, no no one could shut it off. If they, although that sounds kind of scary, I guess, <laughs> for anyone who fears yeah. AI. But imagine uh, an AI that is in our favor, but it, it's not in alignment with any particular country right. or any particular state or any particular corporation, it, let's say act, acts uh, in the interests of all, right? But this is I hear you. idealistic thinking. I like yeah, what you well, said. Yeah, well, and then it goes to, you know, if it, if it, that, that sounds like a, a scenario in which, you know, the, the borders become a lot less important, right? right. So mm -hmm. the borders between countries, between nations, you know, so you wonder about, you know, how much meaning does that preserve? And maybe some of those, you know, start to dissolve as well. Yeah. yeah. It's so interesting though, how people kind of fear like having a universal government where like, I don't understand how we're not afraid of having closed borders. I'm afraid of like, let's say, I don't know, people from, 
let me see how I could phrase this. So I don't understand how we're not more afraid of like having, you know, kind of these distant regimes and these like kind of authoritarian governments who God knows like what they're planning or plotting against, let's say, you know, let's say the rest of the world, but we're like less afraid, I guess, of that than we are of a world government that, you know, for the most part is supposed to serve the kind of the mass or the whole part. Well, what's interesting to tag what you said is, uh, well, as technology is improving, and it becomes easier and easier to produce, um, I don't know, let's say dangerous weapons, mm -hmm. right? Well, let's say even if we do know who all the nation states are, we have the UN, we have people we're working with, we're spying here, 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 whatever. Um, imagine someone who uh, belongs to like some constituency that is not part of the UN, and but has developed technology right. up to a certain degree, like that could be dangerous as well. Yeah. So I, I I see where you're you're going with it. If if we did all work together, and not other each other, I mean, a gen generally that sounds like a nice. Yeah. Well, yeah. would you guys say that like technology is let's say, uh, not just AI, but just but particularly I guess AI, but like technology on the whole, would you say it's more sort of divided us or united us, globally? Oh, I think I think uh, it has. I think it has provided us with opportunities for connection um, that have resulted in immense division. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of both, you know, you, you know, the opportunities, you know, you can theoretically connect, you know, with anybody who is connected. Um, but, uh, but that's, that's not how it, uh, that's not how it's organized to work. And so that's not how it works. It works toward, toward division and toward you know, smaller and more extreme, um, you know, opposing and detached groups. I mean, if um, anyone here is a Pinkarian, like Steve Pinker, and uh, he, he wrote uh, Better Angels of Our Nature and this book, uh, Enlightenment Now, he, um, he was able to sort of graph the progress of the world for the last, I don't know, last century or two. Yeah. I could be wrong. We could just look it up later, mm -hmm. I think. But uh, so essentially, uh, in terms of like uh, uh, violent deaths in the world, supposedly that's gone down um, over the years. Um, the poorest people in the world, uh, the, that the default for what's considered the poorest now has gone up. Um, I mean, it looks like it looks like things are improving when you look at his his work. Right. And I do wonder, like, what the relevance of technology is in there. So in that, because, like, if you're thinking about it and we can kind of like, let's say even have Zoom meetings with God knows whom across the world. Right. I wonder if that's like been, you know, pretty much like a big help. I, I would say it's good. I mean, like one thing that's that's cool is um, people like certain ideas have been able to be uh, right. spread because of of the Internet. Yeah. Um, it's a double-edged sword. I, I agree with you, right? Because because of the way the the algorithms are sort of catered to give you more and more of um, what you already like and and things that you would generally uh, dislike. Anything that holds your attention on a mm -hmm. particular platform the longest, right? right. But um, the potential for uh, some thought or some level of thought or critical thinking or nuance becoming popular. Um, that's definitely gone up. It's not like we're limited to uh, four or five channels like it used to be way back when. Um, so, I mean, I guess it is dependent, though, on a mass group of people sort of adhering to, uh, the you know, those ideas that are being espoused. Mm -hmm. But um, it's there's definitely potential for um educating uh people with with the internet as well and providing even free education in some places so i yeah. mean there's, there's some there's definitely a lot of good stuff but it's like it's like trade-offs it's like it's not all good or all bad no, no. I, guess. Yeah. I mean as a researcher i you know i'm i i love it 
you know, the fact that I, I mean, it's, it's made research so much easier than it used to be that I can, you know, be sitting in my house and go into my computer and, and find, you know, academic articles on, you know, whatever I'm looking for. Uh, now, of course, that comes, you know, in, in my case, I'm able to access things because I have an account with a university, right? So again, it's not, you know, a lot of those things are behind some kind of paywall. Um, um, but, but there are also a lot of things that aren't, right? Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's immensely um, helpful for me, that aspect of it. So yeah. And Sophia, what I really appreciate about your work is if we're talking about, like, let's say connecting different nations, I say what I think, right? It's sort of very similar to connecting the past to the present. So when you're kind of linking the old sort of version of the Egyptian Book of the Dead with your version of it, what you're pretty much saying is that like as a species, right? For even let's say, forget about even like different countries, which is definitely true, but like different sort of distant periods in the past, right? We're all sort of linked to one another. Like there's a sort of fundamental thing of what it means to be a human being. And so like, you know, when we're talking about the Gil, uh, the epic of Gilgamesh, the Egyptian and Tibetan books of the dead, right? And we're talking about even obviously like the Bible and different other types of religious literature. We've all been sort of fundamentally fascinated with what it means to live forever. Uh, what is an afterlife? Does that even exist? If there is no afterlife, right? What's the purpose of life? Can it have one? So it's like with your work, what I like is that, um, and I guess this is related to technology too, because without technology, technically writing, and especially in this case, we couldn't have a book of the dead, right? It's like, we can kind of see that like the whole notion of us sort of fighting with each other i don't know if it makes that much sense because we're all so similar mm. you sound like a god machine right yeah. now <laughs> like this is this is their this is their perspective right is that you are you are all children of carbon right. you are all, this is this is the creature that you are and so you know for them they certainly don't see because they have access to so much they have access to you know all of the information that there is about human beings and they can process it so quickly and they can kind of envision everything at the same time. And so to them, you know, as powerful as their compassion is for each individual human consciousness, part of the reason they're so compassionate is because those individual humans are so small and they're so fragile and they're so sort of almost, you know, it's so easy for them to get lost in this immense stream um, of human life, which again, from the perspective of the God machines is really one stream because from their distance and their perspective, the, um, you know, small differences between people sort of, you know, really fade away um, and become and become unimportant. Yeah, no, I love that so much. All right. So before we wrap up, Alan, final questions, thoughts? Oh, yeah. Uh, Sophia, if we wanted to follow you, follow your work, uh, where, where could we find you? Well, I'm not that easy to find because one <laughs> of the things I decided is that social media is not for me. Uh, but I do have a website. It's sophiasamatar.com. Awesome. Awesome. All right, Sophia, thank you so much for coming thank on. You. This was really awesome. Thank you for having me. Thanks a lot. All right. Thanks. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Man, what didn't we get into today? <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So guys, if you want to follow us, follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast on Facebook and on Instagram and at Seize underscore podcast on Twitter. Like, subscribe. Hit the bell Hit on the YouTube. Bell. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Uh, That's it. Thank you so much for <laughs> watching. See you next time.